So if you have a massive amount of ice, for instance, I remember last year in Greenland, uh, there were these heat domes, as you mentioned in this, you know, as you mentioned with this year over the Ar Arctic region this year as well, these heat domes, you know, raising the temperature to such a point where uh, over an extended period of time where you have, I mean, I can't remember how many, I think it was billions of tons of ice melted um, on Greenland last year. Yeah, and all of that just drained into the ocean. I mean, it just went into the ocean directly. Um, and I know that that, I, from my understanding, is that this ice would be considered fresh water. It's not salt water, so it spills into the ocean. It's right. also cold. It's cold water, even though it's you know it's thawed, but it's cold, so it's spilling into the oceans, and that's impacting the ocean currents as well. So, uh, right. could you explain that and how that how it impacts the oceans and the currents of the oceans? So, yeah, so the the release of fresh water um, you 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 have with ocean currents dense cold salt water that sinks when when it reaches the high latitudes. The fresh water is cold, so it's still relatively dense, but because it has less salt in it, it is less dense than the cold salt water, and so it has a tendency to sink less deep into the deep ocean than the cold salt water. So as a result of that, you, you inject all this fresh water in increasing in amounts into that current circulation. And of course, it's a, it's a huge circulation that goes from the tropics all the way to the polar regions and then goes into the deep ocean and migrates back down to the tropics again and rises again on the other side of the ocean going from west to east you disrupt that circulation you can make the make the um the ocean south of greenland colder and less um and less nutrient rich so because you have less nutrients coming up coming back up so it makes the entire makes other parts of the ocean less nutrient rich because you have less um upward motion back up into the eastern part of the ocean versus the western part of the ocean. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to explain it best I can without a graphic. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but obviously people can look this up, this idea of upwelling on the eastern part of the ocean and then downwelling in the uh in the northwestern part of of ocean basins. But um but basically you have you disrupt that circulation. You have less nutrient rich water rising back up again that can disrupt fisheries um, particularly on the eastern side of ocean basins and you see this happen um, naturally during el nino events during el nino events, you have less cold upwelling on the eastern in the eastern pacific and that can cause um, less uh, a disruption of fisheries so there's less fish to a uh, fish can die from the from the increasing heat in the ocean they can die from uh, having less nutrients in the ocean, so less there's less plankton, which means there's less food in the food chain for the other fish to eat, and so you have die-offs, and of course that affects humans that that actually fish and for those uh, in those fishery regions. So right. it actually has a lot of implications um, biologically and ecologically to have all this water pouring out from Greenland that disrupts these ocean currents. It can, uh, and then having this colder body of water located south of Greenland, um, there's been theories that this could uh, disrupt the jet stream circulation. So you end up having uh, an increasing strong jet stream in the vicinity of that cold dome of, of water uh, because it cools the atmosphere above it, and in fact, there's actually actually some um, evidence to show that it's actually colder in that region south of Greenland than in surrounding areas where it's actually warmer because of global warming. Um, and you get a stronger jet stream in that region because of the increased temperature contrast, so it could produce more powerful storms. And those storms can impact Western Europe, impact the Arctic region going out of the Atlantic. And we've seen that in recent recent couple of years. Where we've seen some pretty significant s storms 
And these storms come out of the Atlantic, so they're very warm, very moist, and they bring abundant, warm, moist transport to the Arctic, and it will rain over portions of the Arctic instead of snow and cause um, sea ice melt in, say, J January or February. I mean, we've seen some, some crazy stuff the past few years in January and February in the Arctic where you get, like, uh, sea ice cracking north of on the north shore of Greenland in the middle of February. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, sea ice retreating because of so much wave action, heat, and rainfall spreading north, uh, far north, uh, over the ice sheet and over the sea ice. So it's 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 interesting that that you mention the loss of water from from these abnormal heat events right over Greenland. Greenland itself still has a ridiculous amount of ice. It isn't going to lose isn't going to lose that ice sheet anytime soon, but that transport of billions of tons of ice melting into water has effects on the ocean currents, has effects on the atmospheric circulation in the region and that has impacts on everything from ecology to meteorology and the storms that that occur in that in that area. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the thing you point to with the storms, so that's something that has been talked about is that we expect a pretty, I mean, th there has been discussion of this about there being um, more severe hurricanes um, and storm, of, you know, weather events or whatever you want to call them in the Gulf region of uh, off the coast of the United States. And of course, that region has been hit with hurricanes, you know, pretty much every year, but the, I guess the issue is the severity of the hurricanes and the frequency. I mean, how, how many of them we're going to experience. So yeah, I guess I, to ask you about that is, I mean, what, what are the impacts on the weather systems um, as far as storms and all of that with, with what we discussed with the ice loss, heating in the Arctic region and all of that? Yeah. So it's interesting because um, hurricanes, if we talk about hurricanes for a second, they're, they're classic heat engines. So they're driven by um, the release of latent heat. As you warm the ocean surface, you get evaporation, heat transports to the atmosphere, and then that heat is released when the water vapor condenses into deformed clouds, and that warms the atmosphere, contributing to more evaporation, and you get a cycle. You get a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop that drives a uh, hurricane circulation. So the tropical cyclones, they depend on, on their, their initial formation depends on the ability to, to uh, lower, to have a batch of thunderstorms that sit over an ocean and the pressure to be lowered by some some means so you have um winds that come in and tra transport air that's rising away from the storm so that the central pressure at the, of the of the developing system at the surface can deepen what we call deepen intensify once you get that it's then a matter of how warm the ocean is and how much heat can be can be derived from that. And so there's a pretty general high consensus that as global warming continues and much of global warming is driven by ocean warming, you'll get storms that are both capable of intensifying faster and reaching higher intensities than they would have otherwise. And there's been recent research demonstrating that both of these things have already occurred. We already have storms in our oceans, tropical systems in our oceans today that are both getting stronger than they than they otherwise would have and are intensifying faster than they otherwise would have if global warming did not exist. Mm. So global warming mm. already has a footprint on, on um, tropical systems and tropical development. Now, I haven't heard any explicit connections between warming in the Arctic and tropical cyclones. Although, as I sit here and think about it, one could hypothesize that if you have, say, um, 
a, a jet stream, a, a polar jet stream that has um, bigger waves because of Arctic warming, and we can talk a little bit about that in a minute, you can get these waves extending not only poleward, poleward, excuse me, so you get these big heat waves that extend all the way to the Arctic, but you also get these troughs, as we call them, these areas of lower pressure that extend farther down where the jet stream, and I say farther down relative to the Northern Hemisphere, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Northern Hemisphere meteorologists talking. So equatorial word is the proper way to say it. They can provide what we call a, a polar, um, a polar um, outflow jet where you, you get initial formation of a tropical system and the air rises and getting, gets blown away from the system by jet streams by jet um, these jet stream patterns that are a little bit deeper into the tropics than they otherwise would be. And they can also help steer the systems out of the tropics more easily and bring them into the mid latitudes, um, causing greater impacts to people that live in the mid latitudes with hurricanes moving uh, northward and, um, and things like that. So, um, that would be an interesting thing to study, how the effects of, this, of a changing jet stream. Although the, although the thing is that there's still a lot of argument among climate scientists about whether Arctic warming is even having a, a, a sizable impact on the jet stream. Um, there's still a lot, of, a lot of sort of internal debate about that. I tend to think it's, it's accurate and some prominent, there are prominent scientists that tend to think that uh, like Michael Mann, Stefan Romsdorf, and some of these other um, well-known climate scientists that think that, in fact, Arctic warming is having an effect on on the jet stream. Uh, but there's still a lot of fighting about that. But um, that is a way I could see that, that 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 pattern could have pattern of change could have an effect on tropical cyclones. But regardless, you are going to continue to see these heat engine storms, these tropical storms get stronger, become more powerful and do so faster um, as global warming progresses. And obviously that's um, devastating to, um, to coastal communities and particularly island communities that are relatively isolated. I mean, we saw what happened with Hurricane Irma and, and Hurricane Michael and and some of these other um, huge, huge um, storms that impacted um, either relatively isolated communities or island communities that are that are just by their nature isolated in the Caribbean. 